The primary way in which zebra or quagga mussels are moved from one basin to another is by hitchhiking on trailered watercraft and equipment, either as attached mussels or as veligers in standing water. If you're involved in any way with the overland transport of watercraft, either as part of your job or as a boat owner, you should know how to inspect for the presence of these mussels and the basic principles of decontamination. Sergeant Eric Anderson of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife will now demonstrate how to conduct a watercraft inspection and decontamination for quagga and zebra mussels. Hello, my name is Eric Anderson and I'm an officer with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And today I'm going to show you how to inspect watercraft for the presence of aquatic invasive species, and in particular, the zebra and quagga mussel. Before we get into an inspection though, I'd like to point out some items that will help you through this process and ensure that you do a thorough job. The first item that you should have is a watercraft inspection form. This form should serve as a checklist to walk you through the inspection. The next item that you can have is a small inspection mirror. A lot of the areas where mussels will settle are really hard to see. The inspection mirror will allow you to reach in and get a better view where otherwise you might not be able to see. Additionally, a small flashlight. A lot of the areas that mussels like to settle are very dark. A flashlight will let you get in there and get a clear view. And the last thing that you should have is a magnifying glass. Remember, early in the video, they talked about mussel that have let, sottled on a surface often have the feeling of grit. A magnifying glass will let you get in there, get a closer view, and see if you actually have mussels. Now that we have these items, let's work through an inspection. After you've got the information of the vessel and its owner on the inspection form, then follow the form through the checklist on inspecting the parts. The first part that we're going to inspect is the hull. You want to remember to do a very methodical and systematic check of the hull and realize that when you do one side of the vessel, you then need to inspect the other. As you're inspecting the hull, you might note on this boat that it has bottom paint on it. This is an anti-fouling paint and this will sometimes retard the muscles from adhering to it, but not always. They still can be attached to it. So make sure you look at the bottom of the vessel and that you're paying attention to anything where there's an edge or an angle. This is an area that, that muscles like to attach to. Also, when you have growth on the bottom of the vessel like this, oftentimes this can mask the muscles. So you need to rub your hand and you'll feel the muscles a lot of times in this before you actually see them. Make sure you work your way down the hull. Another area of the hull to pay particular attention to is anywhere that there's been a scrape in the, in the anti-fouling paint. This provides an area that's rough and it's usually in a hidden area and muscles like to attach there. Now that we've finished the hull, we'll check that off of our checklist and now we'll go to the next item and that is the outdrives. You have to be real careful with the outdrives. There's a lot of working parts and a lot of areas where muscles can attach. Let's go in here and take a closer look. Again, being systematic on it, I like to approach by starting at one end and working my way forward on it. Pay particular attention to the exhaust hub of the propeller. This is an area where muscles can attach and it's very sheltered. They like to get in there. Working up, you can see on the, on the lower part of the outdrive here, this is the water intake. This is where the engine takes cooling water into it. And here you can see we have some muscles attached in there. It's very important to not just look at the outside of the intake. Muscles will get up into those nooks and crannies and be hard to see. Make sure you get to the angle where you can look back up into the intakes and you'll actually see that the muscles are up inside there starting to plug that intake. As you work up the outdrive, you can see this is the cavitation plate. Again, muscles are all encrusted through here at areas where there's a right angle. Anywhere that it's sheltered and shaded, they like to attach. Now we have the hydraulic ram. And a lot of people would think that muscles probably wouldn't attach here because there's so much moving with the ram going in and out. But as you can see, they will attach right up to the point where they do not get scraped off. Moving farther up, we'll get into the gimbal unit. And this is another spot where some of those items I talked about will come in handy. As you can see back in here, it's very shaded. This is where you can use your flashlight to light up and get a better look in there. Additionally, muscles like to attach on the undersides of things, and a lot of times you might not be able to get back up in there and look. This is where the inspection mirror can come in handy. 
you can actually get back in and, under, and see the back side of a lot of these parts. Now we'll move in and we'll inspect the trim tabs. The trim tabs are another area where muscles really like to attach and they're kind of a hard area sometimes to inspect because they have a lot of nooks and crannies, they've got a lot of angles. One in key point is make sure that you get down and look underneath the trim tabs. This is a lot of area, it's shaded and it's sheltered and muscles like to attach there. Pay particular attention to in behind the, the rams of the trim tabs. Again, these are areas where muscles will attach and you'll find large congregations of them. And remember, when you're going through the inspection process and with things such as outdrives and trim tabs, there's always a port side and a starboard side. Make sure that you inspect both units. The next item on the inspection list is the transducer. This is the electronic unit that is known as the depth sounder. And this is the unit that actually sends down the sonar echo. This hangs off the back of the transom of the vessel and provides lots of areas for muscle attachment. Do not overlook the underside. This provides a lot of shade area and muscles will like to attach. Pay particular attention to the bracket and areas around the bracket. And also, don't forget to inspect the wire. After you've finished inspecting the outside of the watercraft, now it's time to move inside. Remember, there are bilges, holds, live wells, and fish wells all contain standing water, and these are areas that mussel and mussel larvae can be in. Make sure you get in and inspect these areas. As you can see down in here, the bilge provides an area where there could be standing water. Anytime you encounter standing water in a bilge or live well, make sure that it's drained thoroughly and that you inspect it. One thing to remember when doing vessel inspections, watercraft come in all shapes and sizes, but that still doesn't change how you do the inspection. Make sure to use your tools, do a methodical process, and you'll work your way through the inspection. One thing to remember on aluminum boats, in particular pontoon boats or welded aluminum boats, there's seams where the welds took place, and these create little adhesion points where the muscles will congregate. As you can see right here, we have muscle attachments all through here. Now we're going to inspect the outboard engine on this vessel. Remember, you can turn the engine to get a clearer look at many parts of it. One of the things, again, you want to concentrate on, look for the water line. This will give you the area to concentrate on while doing the inspection. When inspecting the outboard motors, make sure you pay particular attention to any little recesses, any angles, bolt heads, those are where you're going to find the majority of the muscles attached. As you can see right up in here, we have muscles up in one of the engine bolts. This is a twin drive vessel, so we have two prop shafts to take a look at. Now lots of times when you're doing the inspection of the prop shafts, this will, this will require you to get back up under the boat. and You may have to get a little dirty, but you'll be doing a proper inspection. When inspecting the prop shafts, a lot of times this is where you want to get up and actually reach in and feel. This will add to the, to the visual inspection. You're also double checking by the feel to see if you can feel any of the muscles in there to feel if they're gritty or the bumps. Again, if you feel anything that's gritty, use the flashlight to get a clearer view and make sure what you have. On the back of watercraft, there's usually lots of attachment points. This is the speed indicator for the vessel. You need to take a good look in close on this. This is an area that has lots of angles and lots of potential for muscle attachment. Here are some muscles right here on the dial and a whole lot of muscle encrustation back here on the attachment point in the bracket. Oftentimes, a zinc will not be mounted directly against the hull such as this one. This one is raised on a bracket and this provides an area behind it where you can get a lot of places for muscle attachment. Again, these can be areas that are very hard to inspect. The inspection mirror will come in handy in this, in this case. Besides using the inspection mirror, you can also reach back and you can feel. And lots of times you'll feel, this, you'll feel the grittiness or you'll actually feel the muscles. Another tool that you could use if, if it's at your disposal is a digital camera. You can often turn the digital camera 
focus it up in there and take a picture and then zoom in on it and that'll give you a view. One thing to keep in mind when doing an inspection, zebra and quagga mussels seek out areas that are protected and sheltered. They like areas that they're not going to get scraped off and also areas that provide ample water flow. Through hull fittings provide all these things and make lots of areas for mussel attachment. In addition to inspecting all the various parts of the watercraft, from the hull to the outdrives, transducers to the bilges, make sure you do not overlook things such as fenders. These hang in water. Mussels will attach to them. Also make sure you inspect the anchor, the anchor line, anything that contain water. Even hatches that have life preservers in them. The life preservers can absorb the water and maintain a moist environment where the mussels can survive for a long period of time. On commercially hauled watercraft, the trailers are often overlooked as an inspection area. You'll often hear that a commercially hauled trailer is not in the water long enough for the mussels to attach, and that is the case. However, what you'll find is the mussels can be scraped off of the hull of the watercraft and they'll land and catch on the trailer. Therefore, the next time that, that trailer is backed into the water to launch the watercraft, those mussels can drop off of it and now you have another water body that's infested. When inspecting watercraft trailers, be sure to look for any areas that water may be trapped, such as around the tube openings or the low-lying portions of cross members. Be sure to inspect the bunks, the rollers, and all brackets. Also be on the lookout for any attached vegetation, as it can harbor mussels and villagers. Okay, sir, I uh, finished the inspection, and I was concerned, and uh, my concerns were found. Actually, on the lower unit of your engine, uh, I found... Uh, zebra mussel or quagga mussels here and that's what what we have these came off my boat those came off your boat off the lower end unit on the engine and so what we're gonna have to do is I can't let you launch today uh, at least for right now we we need to decontaminate the boat and make sure that these don't get introduced here into the lake now that we've done an inspection and found mussels it's time to move on to decontamination in this video you will see the large non-portable self-contained wash units However, that's not an option for everybody. Those units are very expensive, and like I said, they're not portable. We're gonna to cover today a portable option that's fairly inexpensive and available to everybody. One of the first things that you need to do in the, in the decontamination process is make sure that you have some type of catchment system so you can deal with the water and the effluent that comes off of the vessel during the cleaning process. Here we have a poly tarp. This can be purchased at any hardware store and relatively inexpensive. We also have PVC pipes to set up a berm. What this will do is this will be a system where we can wash the vessel, the mussels in the wash water will come off of it, go to a low spot and collect. At that point, we can either take and let the water evaporate off and then sweep up the mussel and the debris and deal with them that way, or we can actually sop up the water and take care of it that way. So let's bring on the vessel and put it over here and we'll go to the wash job. For the decontamination on this boat, we're going to use a portable hot water pressure washing unit. This is typical of the units that are available these days. They generally cost under $10,000. One of the big advantages of a unit as this is that it's portable and self-contained. It's self-contained in the fact that it carries its own water so you can take it to remote locations and use it to do decontaminations very effectively. This unit, along with some type of catchment system, and you have all the tools you need to decontaminate a vessel. Proper decontamination of watercraft must be systematic and methodical. Be sure to move the wand slowly, allowing sufficient contact time. Water that comes in contact with the muscles must be at least 140 degrees. With hot water pressure washers, the water can quickly cool after exiting the nozzle and the temperature drop increases with distance, as much as 25 to 30 degrees per foot. Be sure to test your unit to know the proper temperature setting and effective distance to use when you decontaminate. Mussels and villagers can also be found within the cooling system. To use the portable wash unit, remove the spray wand and use the appropriate engine flushing attachment. Start the engine and run for at least five minutes to effectively kill any mussels and villagers in the cooling system. 
As you can see, this low-cost, low-tech catchment system is very effective at containing the effluent from a thorough decontamination of an average size watercraft. On the other end of the watercraft decontamination spectrum is a semi-permanent, fully self-contained wash station. The cost of these systems generally can run anywhere from $75,000 to $250,000 depending upon the unit's size and the number of watercraft it can accommodate at any given time. The one shown here is currently in use at Lake Mead. These systems differ from a low-cost portable unit in that they are able to filter and reuse the water from a decontamination while fully complying with Clean Water Act standards. As with the portable decontamination unit, you must be systematic and methodical to ensure that you do not miss any areas muscles might be and that you have sufficient contact time with the proper temperature of water. There are various flushing and cleaning attachments available that can be used with both the portable and large semi-permanent wash systems. This attachment is designed to flush the through-hull water intake that goes to the engine cooling system. The turbo nozzle seen here is designed to kill and remove mussels on the hard-to-reach underside areas of watercraft. In all cases, remember that the objective of watercraft decontamination is to completely kill and remove the mussels and villagers from all areas of the watercraft.